then we would have a conditional value on the action instead of the categorical action. Okay, so the argument here is really the same as what we talked about before. Um, if it's to be a categorical imperative, it has to represent the action together with its reason, that is the maxim, has to represent that as objectively good in itself, not for any further reason. That means it's universalizable and no further conditions. So think now about what, and, and this is the formula of universal law, first formulation of categorical. So think now about what makes a hypothetical imperative binding for me. Well, it's binding for me, a hypothetical imperative is binding on me when I think of myself as a rational being who can act for reasons and I have a per some particular end. Some particular end that's the condition of the hypothetical imperative. So when I think about myself as a rational being, who has a particular end, who's willing some particular end, then a hypothetical imperative that tells me how to achieve that end is binding on me. It's telling me what it's rational for me to do, given that I'm willing that end. Is that clear? So, should I say that again? Hypothetical imperative. When does a hypothetical imperative apply to me? When does it tell me that some action is rational? Well, when I think of myself as rational, when I think of myself as acting for a reason, for reasons, responding to reasons, and when I have some particular end that I'm willing, that I take to be good, and that hypothetical imperative is saying, if you have that end, you have to do this. There's a way to achieve it. Then that's telling me what reason, and reason is telling, the practical reason is telling me what to do. Given that I'm rational and I have a particular end. Okay, the categorical imperative then is supposed to be binding on me whenever I think of myself as a rational being, regardless of my end. It's supposed to be binding on me as a rational being, no matter what my ends are. It's not supposed to be contingent on having any specific ends. So the categorical imperative uh, is binding on me simply in virtue of my capacity to act on practical reasons. No assumption of any particular so simply in uh, thinking of myself as practically rational, as having the capacity to act for reasons, that is uh, in virtue of thinking my, of myself as being capable of acting in a way that's objectively good, acting on the basis of objective reasons. So should I say that one more time quickly? Hypothetical imperatives are binding on me when I'm a rational being with some particular end that the hypothetical imperative takes as its condition. The categorical imperative is supposed to be binding on me when I think of myself as rational regardless of any ends that I might have. And that makes it may seem as though the categorical imperative has no ends itself at all. It's recommending certain actions as good in themselves, maximums as good in themselves, not simply conditionally good, not simply good in order to achieve some further end. But this is a little bit misleading to say that the categorical imperative has no ends of its own. First of all, the categorical imperative absolutely does generate um, specific demands and duties, at least in certain circumstances, that we have to do certain things. 
that certain maxims are obligatory. Um, and these maxims will require us to act in certain ways. And of course, whenever we act, whenever we will, we have an end. There's something we're trying to achieve. So look, so the categorical imperative might tell us, for example, that it's our duty to save the drowning child. And we can do so. And we're in circumstances in which we can do so. Okay, well, so the categorical imperative is telling us that we have to act on a maxim that will lead us to save the drowning child. When we act in that way, we really do have a goal. There really is an end that we're willing, namely saving the drowning child. That really is our goal. That's the end that we're trying to accomplish. And so the categorical imperative generates duties that have concrete, specific ends. The point is that the categorical imperative itself doesn't tell us that those are our duties in order to generate, sorry, in order to achieve some further end. There's no further end beyond those actions that are required here that explains why those are um, required, why those are objective. objective. Yeah. Could you ever get a situation where you have a categorical and hypothetical imperative fighting against each other for the same? Sure, method? sure, absolutely. So we could have a situation where a hypothetical imperative is telling us to do a certain thing, and the categorical imperative is telling us not to do that certain thing. So what, ha what, what happens in that kind of situation? Right, so, I mean, take the example I just gave. Assume that, for the sake of argument, that the categorical imperative is telling me that I have to jump into the water and save the drowning child. Might there be a hypothetical imperative telling me not to do that? <coughs> sure, like what? I mean, think of a, there are lots of them, but think of a plausible one, a plausible hypothetical imperative that might apply to, might plausibly apply to me, telling me not to jump into the water to save the drowning child. Because, Jumping into the drown and into the water to save the drowning child would bring about some end that I don't like, like getting my clothes muddy. Okay, so there's an end that I'm willing, namely, keep my clothes dry. A hypothetical. Normally, there's nothing wrong with that. Normally, that's a perfectly fine maxim, to, a perfectly fine end to have. And if I will that end of keeping my clothes clean or dry or whatever, then there's a hypothetical imperative telling me, if that's your end, don't jump into the river. If that's your end, it would be irrational to jump into the river. Okay, well, so here's a case where we have a hypothetical imperative conflicting with a categorical imperative. Notice that the hypothetical imperative is only telling me some action is rational given the rationality, given the goodness of the end, keeping my clothes dry. Well, look, so what, what, what we want to say in that circumstance is what? Assume that there's a hypothetical imperative telling me that if my end is to keep my clothes clean, I shouldn't jump into the river. And assume there's a categorical imperative telling me I have to save the drowning child. So, so what's going on? Is reason conflicted against itself? Looks like reason is conflicted against itself. Kant would say, can't happen. So, yes, I'm, for sure I'm supposed to follow the categorical imperative. But what happens to the hypothetical imperative? You could say, you could be like, you couldn't will your clothes clean and brush away and save your child. Will that? 
Um, right, so, so may, maybe that's right. Yeah. The end of the hypothetical is only subjectively good, and the categorical end is subjectively good. Good, exactly. So in that circumstance, the hypothetical imperative says that in order to achieve this end, it's rational to do that. In other words, if that end is good, then these means are good. These means derive their value from that end. In many circumstances, that end is good. And so these means are good. Not in these circumstances, though. In these circumstances, that end of keeping your clothes clean is incompatible with the objective good of saving the drowning child. So I may want that. I may have an empirical inclination for that. But it's not objective. So that's why, the, in this case, the hypothetical, the relevant hypothetical imperative gives way to the assertion of what is objectively good in itself. Let me say that one more time. Hypothetical imperatives say that certain things are good conditional, conditional on the end being good. The categorical imperative says that certain things are good unconditional. So there's no possibility of a hypothetical imperative overruling a categorical imperative. The hypothetical imperative is only going to recommend certain actions on the assumption that something is good as an end. And the categorical imperative is telling us what is good as an end. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, so I've just been saying, I've, I've been making the point that this discussion of the formula of universal law may make it look as though there's no point to the categorical imperative, or that there's no end when we act according to it. And I'm pointing out that this is at least misleading, because when we, because whenever we act, we act with some end some goal that we're trying to accomplish, first of all. Second of all, um, we can, I think, characterize the point of the categorical imperative um, even if there's no single state of the world, no single um, object to be achieved, by acting on it. So we're not going to be able to get a description of the goal of morality in pre-moral language. If we were, that would be a teleological. But Kant is going to find a way to give an account of the point of morality that the goal of morality that obviously is going to have to incorporate moral language, moral vocabulary. Okay, so uh, if, so uh, at 34 on 421, if there is a categorical imperative, this is it. This is it. Um, if there are imperatives of duty, they all have to derive from this fundamental. The whole point of this book is to identify the supreme principle of morality. There it is. There are going to be concrete duties, concrete obligations. They're supposed to derive from this. Um, but this is the supreme principle of morality. Um, so if there is one that is binding and applies to us, that's it. Uh, at this point, Kant is leaving it open whether there is, in fact, one of these. Or more precisely, he's leaving it open whether this applies to us, whether this categorical narrative.